for service with the United States Air Force. By the 1990s, 17 other countries were flying it for air defense. The popularity of the F-16 is easy to explain. It's small, very fast, and highly maneuverable. Great characteristics for a dogfighter. In the hands of the right pilot, it can hold its own against anything flying today. And the F-16 has multi-mission capability. In other words, it can also drop bombs. If you look up and try to see an F-16 from 12, 13,000 feet coming down the chute in a 45 degree dive or so, and you look up at that airplane, you will not see it. You will not see it. At 8,000 feet, you might see it. And by the time you hear the sound, the bomb is going off in your face. Aviators like the way the F-16 responds in the air, and they also like its unique cockpit. The airplane's seat is set back at a 30 degree angle. This helps pilots cope with the plane's 9G turn capability. The plane's bubble canopy gives pilots unobstructed vision. But the most striking feature of the F-16 is its fly-by-wire control system. The F-16 was the first fully electric fighter. All control commands are relayed by wires, not by cables or linkage controls. Pilot and machine become a seamless unit bonded by the plane's onboard computer. The F-16's APG-68 radar gives pilots a clear picture of air and ground threats. When the Falcon is in dogfighting mode, it can fire its two wingtip-mounted AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, as well as Sparrow and AMRAAM missiles. In August 1990, F-16 squadrons began shipping out to the Persian Gulf. Squadrons were drawn from the active Air Force, as well as the Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve. The 249 F-16s sent over flew out of at least four bases scattered across Saudi Arabia. I've uh, got a little bit over 10 years' experience in the military now, flying uh, lots of different types of airplanes. And uh, when I went uh, to the Persian Gulf, our wing did not take any, uh, quote, inexperienced guys. We tended to take guys that had maybe more than 300 hours or so in the airplane, in F-16s, just so that it, it's stacking your team. If you have a group of pilots to draw from, you want to try to take the, the best team you can put together. In the Gulf War, America's team included men and women. For Air Force personnel, female crew chiefs and tanker pilots were nothing new. But for some members of the coalition, particularly the Saudis, the sight of women working alongside men on the flight line was alarming. The Saudis were even more unnerved when they saw female officers giving orders to men. They reported both of the scattered fox drivers for the time. Now for now. Chata, chata, relay. But the sexual integration of the U.S. military was just one of the major changes that followed the Vietnam War. There's no doubt about it, the Vietnam experience affected all of us deeply and provided us uh, great insights. It started out at the national level, the President's Secretary of Defense, who were involved in detail in everything we did, and yet they would leave to the military those decisions that were the military's, picking of targets, for example. I think the fact that we fought the war unrelentingly is also an example. We're in Vietnam, we'd use bombing halts and attempt to negotiate and do those kinds of things that would delay the conflict and prolong the suffering. I think all of us were death against that. day in combat shoot yeah I was nervous uh, and I sure I concentrated a lot lot uh, more than I normally do my head was on a swivel the whole time uh, looking around to see what was going on make sure nobody was gonna shoot me but I remember coming back off the target uh, once I got over the adrenaline rush 
going, that wasn't so bad. I think I can do that again. We will return in a moment to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. January and February 1991, American F-16s bombed Iraqi military facilities, tanks, airfields, chemical factories, and supply lines. They also attacked Iraqi troops in and around occupied Kuwait. F-16s do not carry any laser-guided smart bombs into battle. The airplane isn't fitted with the laser targeting devices needed to drop such weapons. Because their primary targets were military positions in the desert, F-16s usually dropped cluster bomb units and 2,000-pound gravity bombs, weapons with no built-in guidance systems. Many were leftovers from the Vietnam War. F-16s dropped these bombs as part of the coalition's strategy of overwhelming force. The plan was to hit Iraq, particularly its ground troops, as hard as possible for as long as it took to break their will and force a surrender. When bombing, F-16 pilots activate the continuously computing impact point ordnance aiming system, a device that takes much of the inaccuracy out of dumb bomb delivery. A computer calculates airspeed, bomb weight, distance to target, and other factors, so when bombs are dropped, they have a high PK, or probability of kill. However, the higher a plane flies, the worse the PK. Our bomb is designed around a very, very smart computer in the airplane to, once you pickle that bomb off, it's a, it's a hunk of iron falling to the ground. And although it's still a very accurate system, you're talking about, you know, 50 feet uh, is, is, a, is a very average bomb from 10 to 15,000 feet. But 50 feet sometimes is the difference between a, a miss and a hit. So our PK was certainly not as good as the very, very smart bombers. Uh, General Horner and I were obsessed, and that's probably the right word, with having the minimum loss of life. And so there were restrictions that were placed on all of the airplanes as far as minimum altitudes they could fly during the day. And the F-16 uh, was one of the airplanes that had to put up with uh, uh, our restrictions. And so we did not expect them to be as accurate as just a plain physics. But if you honestly do not believe that the outcome of a war is in question, and the only question is how many lives you're going to lose, then that's a prudent action. F-16s and many other coalition planes were restricted to medium altitudes because of Iraq's Vietnam-style tactic of spraying the sky with bullets and surface-to-air missiles. By the end of the Gulf War, two F-16s had been lost to surface-to-air missiles and two others were downed by anti-aircraft guns. F-16 performance was also diminished by poor weather and later by the oil well fires that fouled the skies. The F-16 is at its best on clear, sunny days. One, two, zero, and 10. Standby, unable to give you a radar. There's a 10,000 foot layer, kind of a scud layer where the sand would come up uh, off the desert. The sand there is like a more like a talcum powder than the sand we know in our sandboxes. So you know, any kind of wind picked up, it come up in the atmosphere. So there's always about 10,000 feet, uh, some type of restriction there and below. You can see down, you couldn't see out a good bit, except after a front came through. But not all the F-16s were blind. 72 flew with lantern navigation pods containing terrain-following radar and a forward-looking infrared sensor. Perhaps the major test of the F-16's power and versatility came on February 24, 1991, when after six weeks of air assault, the ground war began. During the last part of the war, uh, just before and when the Army came in, uh, the sense of urgency of the target sets became more real because now they're going to be risking their lives. Before, it was just us in the airplanes, and we fought our own little war. 
But when you added the Army in, now we knew somebody else was involved that we had to uh, help, uh, which now the urgency of whether well, getting to your target, taking out exactly the target that they want you to take out, uh, became a real player. troops, F-16s began flying forward air control missions in enemy areas designated as kill boxes. Kill boxes originated when coalition air planners took a Saudi Air Force map of the Gulf region based on a grid of 60-mile squares, then subdivided those squares into 15-mile boxes. Strike planes were then sent to each box to find and destroy targets. When the ground war started, F-16s were sent on killer scout missions to kill boxes close to frontline troops. And the killer scout mission where uh, they would actually spot targets and identify them and things uh, were very uh, helpful in uh, systematically uh, attreating that ground army because if you take uh, two or four fighter pilots and say, okay, this 15-mile square, uh, you keep coming back every day until basically there's no ground threat there. Uh, it's after a couple days, uh, they are very familiar with every little uh, sand dune in that 15-mile uh, square. F-16s flying killer scout missions were frequent visitors to airborne tankers. Loitering over kill boxes for long periods of time consumes a great deal of fuel. Duck. The ultimate purpose of kill box attacks was to overwhelm Iraqi forces with a shower of munitions falling from the sky like rain. It was hoped that a frightening display of air power would break the will of the Iraqi army. We will return in a Throughout the Gulf War, F-16s attacked soldiers of the Iraqi army and the elite Republican Guard. Studies have shown that when a military unit, no matter how capable or motivated, drops beneath the 50% combat strength level, it becomes all but useless. The coalition hoped that constant air attacks would cause so many desertions, surrenders, wounds, and deaths in the Iraqi ranks that its entire frontline force would fall below the 50% mark. Their goal, however, was not to kill every Iraqi soldier on the battlefield. We could kill a lot of people if we wanted to using, for example, cluster bomb units over large areas. When in fact we went with, uh, for example, laser-guided bombs against tanks. And the enemy knew this, and immediately, they, as soon as they parked their tank, they'd get away, and you'd see the slip trenches appear around the tanks. So every target we looked at, we looked at in terms of how to limit the loss of life and how to destroy those systems that would cause loss of life on the friendly side. Tanks were key targets for F-16s, Apache gunships, and A-10s. Iraq had the fourth largest army in the world, and tank warfare was one of that army's strengths. F-16s often dropped cluster bomb units such as these on or near Iraqi armor. They were somewhat effective, though nowhere near as lethal to Iraq's top-of-the-line tanks as Maverick missiles. When the ground war began and tank killing became priority one, Maverick was the F-16 pilot's weapon of choice. Since it only took one missile to destroy an Iraqi tank, a $70,000 Maverick equal to one and a half million dollar T-72 tank. But air to ground attacks are not always as straightforward as bombing a lone tank in the desert. February 26th, 
Joint Star's surveillance aircraft spot a massive convoy of Iraqi troops retreating from Kuwait City along the highway to Basra. F-15Es, F-111s, A-10s, and F-16s are sent in to shell the hundreds of tanks, trucks, and cars escaping Kuwait. The extent of the destruction caused by hours of steady air-to-ground attacks is frightening. Weeks of watching laser-guided bomb strikes on bridges and bunkers had conditioned the public to view the Gulf War as an elaborate computer game in which faraway targets were obliterated with almost magical precision. The attack on the road to Basra brought the reality of war and the deadly potential of airplanes back into perspective. There was nothing clean about this attack, and the fact that coalition airplanes had launched a full-force assault on a retreating army raised troubling moral questions back in the United States. Should the coalition have allowed the Iraqi army to retreat unmolested? Was air power misused? I was amazed uh, at a question one newsman asked about uh, when we attacked the retreating forces. They said, wasn't that extreme violence? I believe that was the term used. Uh, I think that misses the point. War is extreme violence. And the way to halt the suffering is to get the war over as quickly and decisively as you possibly can. If you're going to enter into this adventure where you take human life and lose human life, you have a moral obligation to get it over as quickly as possible. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known as the Warthog. In an age of stealth fighters and smart bombs, the A-10 is a primitive airplane. It is neither fast, nor elegant, nor state-of-the-art. OK, I'm in from the uh, southwest. Ops check 3.8. I'm setting up the bombs. Copy, you're going to get one pass at it. Copy that. A-10s were the most vulnerable combat planes in the Gulf, but they were deadly efficient at their mission, destroying enemy tanks. Although it looks like an old design, the A-10 is one of the youngest planes in the Air Force inventory. It was developed by Fairchild Industries in the 1970s to defend the NATO nations against a Soviet ground attack. The A-10 is built around a gun, the 21-foot Gau-8 Avenger cannon, which spits out 4,200 shells per minute. A-10s can linger over target areas for hours, swooping in low to attack with cannon blazing. Flying low exposes the Warthog to ground fire, but the plane is protected by its rugged titanium shell and redundant systems. All the aircraft's major systems have backups. The plane was built to take severe punishment and get its pilots home. A-10s have been in service since 1977, but they have never been favorites of the Air Force leadership who generally prefer high-tech, high-flying aircraft such as the F-16. The A-10 is anything but high-tech, in fact, the plane looks and flies more like a World War II era fighter. Warthogs are flown by stick and rudder controls, not by onboard computers. Though they carry some advanced systems, A-10 cockpits are still dominated by old-fashioned dials and gauges. This lack of sophistication can be an advantage. A-10s are far less expensive than F-16s and they take punishment their supersonic cousins would have difficulty surviving. But as the 1980s ended, the A-10 seemed destined for the scrap heap. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc made the possibility of fighting a ground war in Europe remote. A-10s were scattered among a few Air Force units, the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard. Flying the A-10 for over 10 years now, we had practiced with the the uh, Eastern Europe scenario flying against uh, Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, low altitude uh, type of uh, scenarios, working close with the Army, uh, doing the, the type of things, air to ground, close air support. 
However, in the Persian Gulf, it was all totally different. In a low, medium intensity conflict, we jacked up our altitude to stay away from the AAA. We were mostly worried about the ground threat. The Gulf War thrust the Warthog into frontline combat. But it was rumored that the Air Force hadn't wanted to send the A-10s over at all because they feared the slow-flying planes would be easy prey for Iraqi anti-aircraft guns. On January 17, 1991, A-10s were among the 668 coalition aircraft that took to the air for the first massive assault of the Gulf War. Missions were long, and pilots were taxed to their mental and physical limits. I flew uh, three missions on the first day, a uh, total of about uh, eight hours of flying time and about 12 hours in the cockpit. When you came back from a mission, uh, you didn't even get out. Uh, you hot pit refueled as you sat there with engines running, going over with the intel people on what you did, where you went, and how it all worked out. They gave you current intel, and then uh, you moved over to another slot where they put the bombs and guns on board. Uh, basically, as uh, 12 hours in the cockpit doesn't really we train for it, but you're really not, it, it's never comfortable in a single seat cockpit with an injection seat. However, uh, we've done it before and you can do it over and over. It's, uh, by the end of the day, they actually have to help you out of the cockpit. A-10s were in constant danger of attack from Iraqi surface-to-air missiles. To stop the SAMs, F-4G wild weasels were sent in with radar-seeking missiles. With their radar neutralized, Iraqi soldiers fired blindly at aircraft noise. But the A-10 is relatively quiet. So quiet, the Iraqis called it the silent gun. Nine times out of ten, as you're rolling in on a target, you're concentrating so much on the bombing run that you really don't, can't think about the AAA. If you do, you're going to have a lousy pass. You're usually hearing it from your wingman saying they're shooting you up pretty good at uh, AAA. You better start moving. You pull into off into the cloud. Hopefully that, that they're only going with a visual type of shot at you. But uh, yeah, it, uh, we've seen it all. And they said that you only see probably about 30 to 40 percent of the AAA fired at you. So that's the, just with the tracers and the rounds that are blowing up around you. The rest of the stuff you never see. Turn in a moment to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. He's not moving. He's going to live. What are you? You look dead. What are you? You look like something. Okay. You don't think that there's three guys in that tank that you just put a maverick. You think, well, uh, you know, that, that was just a tank. And I think you, you depersonalize it yourself. If you didn't, you, you, it's sort of like uh, knowing that people are out there shooting at you. It's, uh, it, if, you don't, if you think about it, tube and tents, and sit there at night uh, between the scud attacks, and then, yeah, it's going to drive you crazy. A lot of guys go to church a lot <laughs> all of a sudden, and they see things different ways. You do a lot of sitting, uh, watching the sunsets as you're coming back over the border. You have another hour of flight just to get back to the home base. So you watch the sunset and you think about things and you, you, it's, it's your time to, to move off to the side and forget about what you're doing for a little while. And, and yeah, it takes a lot of, uh, I guess, discipline to think about what you're doing, what you're, the reasons you're doing it. And I'm sure everybody had to go through that in their mind. And, uh, you know, everybody came out with it uh, fairly well. The A-10 was the least sophisticated strike airplane in the Gulf, but it was also one of the deadliest. The 144 A-10 sent to Southwest Asia flew almost 8,100 missions. They destroyed more than a thousand enemy tanks and thousands of other vehicles and artillery pieces. A-10s can carry up to 16,000 pounds of ordnance on 11 external stations, including cluster bombs and Maverick missiles for ground attack and AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles for air-to-air -air combat. But more often than not, pilots use their Avenger cannons against tanks, and in a first, against an Iraqi helicopter. I rolled in on a helicopter, so, oh, from about 12,000 feet. 
Uh, nobody had fired an air-to-air -air missile off an A-10. We had, we, it was the first time, of course, we were carrying them in war, the AIM-9s. Uh, so I tried to lock on with the AIM-9s, uh, and they just wouldn't do it because of the, the hot background and the, and the helicopter looking down from that altitude. I tried two lock-ons, and fortunately, I remembered to uh, arm up the gun. Uh, once I couldn't get a lock, I decided to put a few bullets through him, so maybe 75 bullets. I told my wingman if he had a shot to take a shot. He tried, but his slant range was too far off, so he missed, and then I just pirouetted over and put about 300 rounds into it, and uh, there wasn't much left after that. Maverick was the A-10's other primary tank-killing weapon. These 500-pound guided missiles reach supersonic speed when they hit their targets, and not even the best armor can survive a direct hit. There are two types of Mavericks. Television-guided missiles are used in daylight. The missile sees contrasts between objects and backgrounds. Maverick is a fire-and-forget weapon, so when a pilot fires his missile, the video image cuts off. Infrared Mavericks, which were used in great numbers in the Gulf, detect targets based on differences in temperature. Since metal cools at a slower speed than sand, it was easy for pilots to spot tanks in the desert. Okay, I've got what appears to be a building and some uh, distinct hot spots around it. Roger, that's your target. Okay, he said north. The area should be... Mavericks were sometimes used by A-10s equipped with Pavepenny pods. Pavepenny detects the laser beams used to mark targets by laser designation planes. A-10 pilots have earned their reputation as down and dirty fighters by making the most of the limited materials on hand. For instance, the pilots of the 355th Tactical Fighter Squadron, the only dedicated night-flying A-10 unit in the Gulf, sighted targets by using the video system from their infrared Mavericks as a sort of poor man's forward-looking infrared scanner. The night fighters also employed the primitive but effective tactic of dropping flares over their targets. A-10 pilots sometimes wore night vision goggles and sighted targets through regular binoculars. Ground troops or other pilots called in airstrikes. Then A-10s flew in, dropped their blinding flares, then strafed and bombed targets at will. The Iraqis did their best to hide their armor to little avail. Here, a night-flying A-10 has spotted an Iraqi tank hidden under netting designed to hide its infrared hotspot. The shape of the tank is obscured, but the tank tracks around the netting are easy to see. By the end of the war, Iraq had lost over 90% of its tanks, 90% of its artillery, and 50% of its other armored vehicles in the Kuwait theater of operations. The Iraqi soldiers who survived the non-stop air assault were those who learned to put as much distance between themselves and their weapons as possible. Okay, we got people running. Gosh, personally, I, I don't know. I, I stopped counting. I stopped counting the number of missiles I fired. I stopped counting the bombs I dropped. It's just, as I said, I, I guess I, someday in my mind it'll come to me, but I sort of push that off to the, the, the corner of my mind. It's uh, you just uh, go from day to day, and you write your letters home, and then you go to sleep, and you get up for your next mission. So, but uh, if I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many tanks. Uh, I just didn't keep count. The problem we faced with the A-10 was the fact uh, that because of its slower airspeeds, it was more susceptible to enemy ground fire. With about 10% of our forces, we suffered over half our casualties on the Air Force, United States Air Force side, through the A-10. I think the Marine Corps had a similar problem with the AV-8 because of the way the engines are located along the center line of the aircraft and the heat-seeking missiles would strike the middle of the airplane rather than the tail. So uh, you have to look at each aircraft's design and weigh its strengths and weaknesses to know where to use it in the battle. Uh, the A-10s were superb, however, uh, they were more vulnerable to the enemy defenses. That vulnerability was offset by the A-10's amazing resilience. Pilots flying into anti-aircraft fire were particularly thankful for the titanium bathtub, 
the super hard cockpit shell that shields them from flak. I'm telling you. I isolated both hydraulic systems. As soon as I was hit, the right system went to zero, and all the lights in the world came off. The missile went off, and I thought it was the SAM going by, so I started kicking flares out the back. And, uh... Good show. I wish I'd have kept it on the runway for you, but the yeah. tire blew and I just couldn't keep it on. Uh, you know, when you see a missile come at you, you and you're in a four ship, you wonder who it's locked onto, and, and yeah, I guess you you're, you see a lot going on, and, and you react, and AAA going off near you, and it's scary, and then it's tough sometimes. Sometimes they'll have to take you off of the schedule and say, well, why don't you go do this on the ground for a while, give you a day off, uh, just prop your feet up and relax. But uh, there's not much they can do. Uh, I'm, I, we're glad it was a short war. Uh, you know, it was, I don't know how else to keep you from getting burned out other than give you the day off or two. Uh, we did have guys that, you know, just said, well, I, I, you hold your hand up just like in the old football games, I need out, coach. And, then, and pretty much we let it go with that. We will return in a moment to weekday wings on... A-10s work near, but generally not directly alongside, advancing army units. Low-level search and destroy missions were handled primarily by the army's fearsome Apache gunships. The massive assault kept Iraqi ground forces from maneuvering. If they tried, they were pounded by tanks, artillery, and air power. Roger, uh, we got a whole bunch of guys throwing AK-47s up in the air down here. Does that mean anything? I'll shoot them, shoot their equipment. Okay, Roger that. They're just, uh, we're going to back away from them a little bit. Our gun is out of ammo at this time. Okay. They seem to be no threat at all. Okay, zero six five, eighteen hundred meters. They just want to be driving away a bunch. This is, uh... The air attacks cut enemy soldiers off from food and water. Constant bombing left thousands in shock. Soon, the coalition army found itself overwhelmed by surrendering troops. By the end of the war, more than 86,000 Iraqis were in custody. When I talked to you all before, and you asked me what we were going to do if we had to go to war, and I told you we were going to kick ass, and that's exactly what we did. Norman Schwarzkopf, commander of coalition forces, expected the ground phase of the war would last three weeks. In fact, it took just 100 hours to recapture Kuwait and neutralize the Iraqi army. But ground forces moved so quickly and the speed of combat was so fast that coalition attackers mistook some of their own invading army for retreating Iraqi soldiers. At least 11 Americans were killed and 15 wounded from air to ground friendly fire. We had some uh, friendly fire issues, and uh, they are disturbing. There's no doubt about it. We had an A-10 hit uh, a Marine vehicle. I believe we had a Marines rolled in on a Marine column. We had an A-10 hit two British vehicles or two A-10s. And we had a number of incidents uh, ground to ground. Now, in taken in total, this number is relatively very, very small. It's minute. But the problem is, nowadays, with the lethality of modern airplanes, if you have one incident, it results in seven or eight fatalities, or in past wars, such an incident might reflect a, a damaged vehicle or a wounded person. So we have to work this issue very, very hard. Roger, the reason I'm asking is, uh, need to find out if this is a friendly or not. Yeah. They put in a lot of restrictions to try to protect against the friendly fire episodes. They put a lot of restrictions on anything that was going to do air to ground in cl close proximity to the troops. We had trained years of working with the Army, but the Army basically with their attack helicopters uh, took care of most of the, the uh, threats in their general vicinity. We worked further north, anywhere from three to five miles. We were able to watch the tanks roll across the border and watch them uh, attack different Iraqi positions, but normally they'd want us away from their actual uh, sphere of influence. It was like a blitzkrieg all over again with our tanks rolling through at 40, 50 miles an hour shooting on the run. 
Over the course of 43 days, more than 2,600 aircraft flew 110,000 sorties that crushed Iraq's defenses and left its troops battle-weary and anxious to surrender. Laser-guided weapons let us drop fewer bombs for greater effect than in past wars. But it should not be forgotten that the ultimate result of a massive military offensive is massive loss of life. The chief difference between this war and others is that the balance of casualties was wildly uneven. Coalition forces lost roughly 200 soldiers in combat. The Iraqi army lost at least 100,000. Here, Americans bury an Iraqi soldier killed during Operation Desert Storm. One of the things from Desert Storm that bothers me deeply, uh, they call it the Nintendo War. The idea that it's nothing against my computer against your bunker, or my bomb against your truck. It loses sight of the fact that uh, there's great suffering and death involved in war. And we must never use war as a solution to anything other than as a last resort. So if we learn anything from Desert Storm, I hope it is that we don't want war, that war doesn't work, and that a would-be aggressor in the world will think twice before he engages in war. Uh, I hope that on our side, that our people don't think that war is some sort of a bloodless, uh, mechanical thing. It is a terrible, terrible thing, and we must be very, very careful of how we enter into war and what we expect to get out of it. Was the Gulf War a successful campaign to liberate a powerless nation from the clutches of a fascist invader? Or was it a violent dispute over control of the world's oil supply? Was the war a watershed event that saw the United Nations act as one to tame a powerful rogue state? Were diplomatic sanctions given enough time to work? These questions are still being debated and perhaps years will pass before the Gulf War's historical significance is decided. But it is certain that the conflict was a turning point in the history of warfare. For the first time, a massive round-the-clock strategic air campaign was directly responsible for a decisive victory over a well-defended enemy. After 80 years, air power fulfilled its deadly potential. Return in a moment to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. We now return to Weekday Wings on the Discovery Channel. Hey, Benny, give me a quick rep on that tank. You can tell we've got such a high tech uh, to figure out how much gas we got, we go beat on it with our knuckles. Fuel flow at 140 gallons. The Strategic Air Command deployed 256 KC-135 tankers and 46 KC-10 tankers during the Gulf War. Tankers are flying gas stations. Air refueling gives gas-guzzling fighters and bombers the ability to stay in the air. This was crucial in the Gulf War, where some strike aircraft had to fly a thousand miles to their targets, then a thousand miles home again. Every aircraft from every surface, as well as many coalition planes, used U.S. Air Force tankers. KC-10 Extender first flew in 1980. The Air Force has 59 in its inventory. The KC-10 was based on the commercial DC-10, and it combines the task of tanker and cargo carrier in one body. It can service all U.S. military aircraft and many NATO planes. The KC-135 Stratotanker looks like a Boeing 707 but it was designed to carry heavy fuel loads. It first flew in 1956. 633 are now in service. 
The Stratotanker is closely identified with another, even longer-serving SAC airplane, the B-52 Stratofortress. Like the B-52, the KC-135 has been updated and redesigned over the years. The Air Force expects it will continue flying well into the next century. And we're latched. common problem most military pilots have faced is the phenomenon of vertigo. Vertigo often hits you when you're trying to hook up to a tanker during a rainstorm in pitch black weather. Your body tells you that your plane is crooked and you're going to crash. Your instruments say you're fine. It takes a great deal of discipline to trust the machine, not your senses. This is your uh, post. This is a post and a free. gets to be second nature. Every guy that flew fighters over there probably did 200 plus hookups during the war. We met tankers about uh, 70 miles from our departure point and uh, we refueled with the tankers all the way down through the Gulf and, and uh, into our destination uh, over in the Emirates. But uh, shoot 10, maybe eight refuelings, quite a few. Especially when you load up the A6 with 10,000 pounds of ordnance, 10, 1,000 pound bombs. There's a lot of drag out there, and you can suck down an enormous amount of gas. And it was always a little comforting to know that there was a tanker up there and you could hit it once you came out of bad guy country. unsung heroes in this war are the tankers because they fill the skies of Saudi Arabia and Iraq and I might have had Iraq yes there were tankers over Iraq refueling fighters and bombers during Operation Desert Storm tankers flew approximately 15,500 sorties refueled 46,000 aircraft and offloaded 110 million gallons of fuel Coming up, it's the ultimate do-it-yourself show. Learn the tricks of the trade. Professional home repair made easy on Gimme Shelter. Then, go on the hunt. From chilly Alaska to sweltering Africa, nature's adventures continue on Wild Discovery.